The first reading is from the third chapter of 1 Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is, an, is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? For you will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, from Jesus, our Redeemer, and from the Holy Spirit who sustains us all. 
Both this first reading and the gospel show us glimpses of what it means to be called by God. I want to give you a little bit of context for the first reading because it's not something that we talk about too, too much. There are two people in this story. There's Eli and Samuel. Eli is a priest. He's kind of towards the end of his career. And Samuel was a young boy who was born after his parents didn't think that they could bear children. They prayed for him for years. And so after he was promised to them, they promised that they would give his life to the Lord. So they give him to the temple to be raised there, to grow in God, and to be molded by Eli, to be formed by him. And so once he was weaned, they did that, and they left him to be raised there. And he becomes Eli's student. And as for Eli, typically the line of priests was continued through his family. You hear in this reading um, Samuel being told that he needs to tell something to Eli, um, that his line is going to end. It's because his sons had done some really terrible things, some wicked acts. Um, and so the, the line is no longer going to continue through Eli, but will eventually continue through Samuel as he becomes the priest who anoints King Saul and King David, important figures in the Old Testament. And so at this point, Samuel is a young boy. In the middle of the night, Samuel hears a voice calling out to him. It was God's voice, only initially he doesn't really recognize that. I'm sure if I heard a voice in the middle of the night, I would probably go to the person nearest me. I probably wouldn't immediately assume that it was God. But he goes to Eli four times, and it's on the third time that Eli realizes it was God who was calling out to him. And Eli directs Samuel to respond to God, to say, here I am, and to say that he is listening, his servant. God shows up to Samuel in this story. Scholars call moments like these theophanies, moments when God is there in person. In the Old Testament, that is a huge deal because it doesn't happen all the time. There's only a few of these moments. And so when we're reading those scriptures, this is a moment that we usually pause when we see what God is doing because God is saying something very important here. These theophanies are high peaks in scripture. In this story, God is showing up to this young boy, and God is instructing him to reveal the punishment that will come to the house of Eli because of his sons, and to Eli for not stopping them. It's a big moment and a pretty hard call for a young boy. In the gospel, we see Jesus call some of his first disciples. This is a big moment for Philip and Nathaniel. It's a moment that they first meet Jesus, the Son of God, even if they haven't fully recognized it yet. It's a moment that will start them in their lives of following after Jesus. When Jesus tells Philip to follow him, he immediately comes and sees who Jesus is. But Nathaniel, after Philip tells him about Jesus, is a little bit more skeptical at first, or maybe we're seeing his own negative biases coming in because he says, will anything good come out of Nazareth? I think Jesus meets him with a little bit of a sassy and a sarcastic remark saying that in, in him, in Nathaniel, there is no deceit. I think he's kind of calling him out for his insult. I think that this moment when Jesus calls him out maybe builds a little bit of curiosity in Nathaniel, maybe some trust, because I think Jesus is going to show him a new way and show him himself. So Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And in inquiring further, Jesus says that he saw him under a fig tree. The text doesn't reveal what happened under the fig tree or when he was under the fig tree. It's not really clear. But it must be something significant. Because when, when Jesus says that, Nathaniel immediately sees who Jesus is and begins to follow him. It is in both of these disciples in this moment that their lives change as they start to follow up after Jesus as they have callings to follow God. Each of these stories is a call story, a call narrative. They're stories of grandness, where God is calling people into their life of discipleship in a life of following after God. Both of these texts invite us to re recall the moments in our lives that we have been called, all of us. In seminary, we spend a lot of time talking about callings. I think I've told my call story 
maybe in the 50 times. Um, I've had to write it out at least 10 um, to share about how I felt first called to ministry. And for me, I usually recount this big moment when in middle school I started to sense God telling me that one day you will be a pastor. It's a journey that I am still on. And while that was a big moment for me, I think what really has stood out to me in in recounting my call is that there's these little moments along the way after that that have really started to stand out to me more. These little moments where I see my calling change, shift, or move form. Like when I came to this place and I realized that I was called to become a Lutheran and I had no idea that that was going to happen. There are these little moments that start to change and mold our callings as our vocations change in different seasons of our lives. There's been conversations that I've had with friends that have molded me more and molded me further. There have been times that I've gotten to talk to mentors and learn some deep things about what being a minister is like that have formed me deeply. There have been times or that I've read entire books that have really changed how I've seen God working and moving in the world as a little line that I read might transform my perspectives. And sometimes I feel that I'm being changed and molded in my calling when I'm walking at night and I'm walking my dog and I just sometimes pause and stand there and, and, and I feel God's presence with me and I feel reaffirmed and reignited in, in what I am called to do. You see, what I think I've been learning about calling is that more often than not, it's not the big moment, but it's the small moments along the way that carry us. The big moment might might ignite us, but it's not the one that completes us. I think callings are found throughout the processes of our lives, as our callings are refined and expanded in little tiny moments. Like these callings for Samuel, for Philip, and for Nathaniel, this was just the starting point. It was when they began to trust God with their lives. But that's not where it ends for them. Their callings take twists and turns along the way. A lot of times when we talk about calling, it's in reference to a job, to being a pastor. But really, callings are for all of us. It's about our lives and how God molds us. In the first reading, Samuel is not called to the priesthood at that moment yet. He's called to reveal a hard truth to his mentor. And it's in this moment that he begins building some necessary skills that what's going to build him later down his life. And it's in this moment that God uses him and that God starts molding him to proclaim the truth. The text says towards the end of that reading, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground in all of Israel. Knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. As Samuel grew, God was with him throughout the journey. And it was because of that that people are able to build trust in him. Because Samuel keeps being called. And Samuel keeps following God along the way. Samuel shows up for his community and keeps building trust with him. As his calling is refined and expanded throughout his life, it too takes pivots. He ends up calling two different kings when he thought he would only call one. He ends up becoming a priest when it was not through his line of succession. Vocation is the area where we get to live out our callings. As Lutherans, we believe that all are called. It's just a matter as to where. And that is where we get to discern. Vocation is where Christians live out their baptismal promises. Luther writes and talks about it a lot. And I love what he says because I think it bears truth for us. Vocation is the realm in which we all live out our baptismal promises. It's it's in the freedom that we find in Jesus that we are able to dedicate our lives to the care of our neighbors, the care of our world, in all the different ways that we are uniquely gifted. Luther talks about it beyond just the one-time calling, beyond something just for clergy, but something for all of us. And we all have it, whether we notice it or not. Our vocations may contain many callings along the course of our lives. 
Sometimes it's a bigger moment, like when you get married, that's a big moment, when you promise yourself to another person, and y'all journey through life together, and as your family becomes an aspect of your calling. Or it may be when you get your first job or when you step into retirement. But there's also a ton of little moments that happen along the way that we reaffirm our callings, that we reaffirm our vocation, and we get to live out the life that God has for us. Like I said, our vocations are not limited to our jobs or careers. They're just aspects of where we are called and aspects of how we get to use the gifts that God has given us. As our gifts are refined and expanded, as we learn more and as we grow more, our callings to our vocation to changes. And we get to discover new aspects of ourselves, and God gets to use us in new and unique ways as we find new ways to meet the needs of our community. Luther talks about how vocation is in four different areas of our lives. Technically, he said there was three, but at that time, the home and the job were kind of one, and so we can think about it in four ways. Our homes, our families, how we dedicate ourselves to them. I think sometimes our close friends are in this area, in this arena as well. Our jobs or the places where when we're retired, we work and dedicate ourselves to. Our civic lives, our lives as citizens in our community and our life here in the church as we get to be reminded of God's abundant grace. Each of these different spaces of vocations is just as important as the next and just as needed in our world. (coughs) Like our family, the way we show up for them matters. The way that we show our care and devotion, the way that we show God's love with them. It's when we show and care that we spend time and how we spend time with them and reminding them in small moments that they are loved by us and maybe remind them when they remind us that we are loved by them. Sometimes we see our vocation when we let our partner or our kids or our grandkids decide where we eat lunch after church rather than us deciding for ourselves. Maybe it's as simple as making your spouse coffee before you leave in the morning. One of my professors, as I said earlier, he finds his vocation when he walks his dog in the morning. For me, I see vocation in my mom as she bakes me cherry pie every time I come home because she knows that it's my favorite. Or my neighbor who lets out my dog for me when I'm gone the day here at work. We get and receive love each day as we care for those we are closest to. And we get to see our vocations as we live it out in that space. You're probably living it out without even recognizing it. Our vocations, too, show up in our jobs or at school or in retirement as we get to make the world better in the spaces that we are in. Everything that we do in these spaces is essential to living together in community. From a teacher at school who helps kids learn how to read or teaches them about plate tectonics, or to a student who finally figures out how to multiply a fraction, to a retiree who volunteers at the hospital, making people feel comfortable in a space that is uncomfortable, or somebody who spends time diligently in their garden, or spends hours perfecting a piece of art, making it a masterpiece. I see it also in young adults that I know, one who works to make nuclear reactors safer. Each of these different ways that we show up and each of the different gifts that we have matters. And it's where we live out our vocations and as God uses us in our world. We see it too in our government as we show up as citizens in our own community. Whether it's taking time to research to learn more about what's happening in our world. Or whether we show up at our local city council meeting to make our voices known. Or we advocate about something we're passionate about. Or maybe it's just by picking up trash along this road as you see it. Another area that we live out our vocation is the church. When we get to be reminded of God's grace and as God forms us and molds us here. Maybe it's in volunteering at VBS, showing up to a Wednesday night dinner and enjoying fellowship of your fellow church members. Or coming to a Bible study or singing in the choir or distributing communion on Sunday morning. These are all the different ways that we show up in this space. Like I said, you're probably doing it and you just don't even recognize it. These are all different places that we are called 
in all different places that God is using us. As God uses our unique giftings to make this world a better place. I've seen it said that God doesn't need us to do anything, but our world certainly does. And without us doing the things that God is calling us to, we aren't able to love our neighbor to the fullest. Our vocations contain the fullness of who we are, as God continues to call us and mold us in each moment that we live in. Not just our initial moment of calling, as we are called to be God's disciples. But it's in all of these different multitudes of moments, all these different moments in their multitudes, as we show up with who we are in our world. As I said, we see the glimpses of the callings in these stories, and Samuel speaking truth to his teacher, to his priest. But we also see the life and the disposition that this calling cultivates in him as he journeys throughout his life and as he is being formed. With Philip and Nathaniel, we see this too in the moment they are called to follow after Jesus. But they do a lot more as they follow after him. They help him serve the needy. They help him minister to the sick. They help him bring about a world with more justice in it. As the disciples are called in this moment, they are formed and molded throughout their lives with Jesus. For them, this is just the beginning and they have far more to see and experience throughout the course of their lives. Many of us are in different seasons of our vocation, from students in school to to people who are working to people who are retired. We are all in different spaces and different seasons, and each of them is as valuable as the next, and each of them is as needed in our world. And we get to live into where God is calling us in all the different moments. As we follow after God, as Samuel did, and as the disciples followed after Jesus. So as we go on from here, may we remember the assurance that we have in God. May we remember where God is calling us, that God has call, already called each and every one of us. And may we pay attention to the little moments of the little callings along the way, as we continue to be formed and molded in our vocations. And as God continues to use us in our world to make this a better place. Amen.